of God who searches the heart. Do you confess that you have sinned, and do you repent of your sins? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins, and do you desire forgiveness in his name? Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of our Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. May he comfort your heart by his holy absolution, and strengthen you by his sacraments, that your joy may be full. Peace be with you. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Oh, me. 
let us application. Eleison, Eleison, Kyrie, O God, the Holy Ghost, God our faith, the gift we need the most, do Thou our last hour bless. Let us leave this sinful world with gladness. Laison and To us no harm shall now come nigh, the strife at last is ended. God showeth his good will to men, and peace shall reign on earth again. Him for his good. Pour out, we beseech thee, thy Holy Spirit upon thy faithful people. Keep them steadfast in thy grace and truth. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all enemies of thy word. And bestow upon Christ's church militant thy saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth, and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. O God, who causest wars to cease to the ends of the earth, forgive us our godlessness and hatred. Hear our prayers on behalf of all who suffer at the hands of aggressors, and grant an end to strife, so that thy people may worship thee in peace, and call others to Christ in freedom, through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on Reformation Sunday is recorded for us in the second book of the Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 12 through 19. In the days of Hezekiah the king and at his command, these Levites arose, Mahath the son of Amasai and Joel the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Korathites, of the sons of Merari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehaliel, of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joah, of the sons of Elizaphan, Shimri, and Jael, of the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah, of the sons of Haman, Jehiel, and Shimai, and of the sons of Jeduthun, Shemaiah, and Uziel. And they gathered their brethren, sanctified themselves, and went according to the commandment of the king at the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Then the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the debris that they found in the temple of the Lord to the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it out and carried it to the brook Kidron. Now they began to sanctify on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And on the 16th day of the first month, they finished. 
Then they went in to King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings with all its articles, and the table of the showbread with all its articles. Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified, and there they are before the altar of the Lord. Here ends the lesson. epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in the revelation of Jesus Christ to St. John chapter 14 verses 6 through 7. St. John recorded for us, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Here ends the Holy Epistle.
Arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 11 at the 12th verse. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come, he who has ears to hear. Let him hear the rest of the Holy Gospel. fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God who jealously guards his word on our behalf. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. 
from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here, once again, uh, the latter portion of our Old Testament lesson that serves as the basis of our meditation, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, um, beginning at about verse 14. And they gathered their brethren, sanctified themselves, and went according to the commandment of the king at the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Then the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the debris that they found in the temple of the Lord to the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it out and carried it to the brook Kidron. Now they began to sanctify on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And on the 16th day of the first month, they finished. Then they went in to King Hezekiah and said, we have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings with all its articles, and the table of the showbread with all its articles. Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified, and there they are before the altar of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make us holy in the truth. Your word is true. Amen. Please be seated. Make us holy in the truth. Your word is truth. In our day, it seems like the only place we can find truth for sure is in the Holy Scriptures. When we try and figure out what's going on in the world and what the truth is behind the scenes and all of that, it's sort of like watching one of those news magazine shows about the unsolved mysteries or rehash of some mystery that took place. And first half of the show will present you with one side and you'll look at something and go, oh, that guy's definitely guilty. And then they take a little advertising break and they come back and they present you the flip side of it. And by the end of that, you go, oh, that guy's actually innocent. And you get led one way and then the other. And we didn't sing it as a pre-service hymn today, but a few weeks ago, when I noted that it's probably the most somber Sunday of the church here, I think it's the Sunday before we celebrated St. Michael and all holy angels, that hymn, O oh Lord, look down from heaven, behold, and let your pity waken. How few are we within thy fold, thy saints by men forsaken. Um, that hymn, at the time, at the time of the Reformation, was kind of the battle hymn of the Reformation. And uh, uh, shame on me, I didn't encourage you to rise as we sang the opening hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, in our day, it's sort of the custom to rise and sing that because it's sort of a triumphal anthem of the Lutheran Church that we remember that God holds the battlefield forever. He's the one who has the victory. But that, that hymn that at the time of the Reformation was more the battle hymn, O Lord, look down from heaven, behold, it goes on to talk about how the, uh, the teachers come up with their own ideas of things out of their own minds and wandering of thought. And they lead the people to and fro, the hymn says, in errors, maze, astounded it all sounds good but it leaves you baffled in regard to the truth such as that the truth when presented to people seems absolutely astonishing and baffling and as if it couldn't possibly be true <coughs> so on the one hand we recognize that that hymn was written in the face of the Roman Catholic Church um, leading people astray. Instead of pointing people to salvation by faith in Jesus alone, the teachers were teaching that salvation was by the work of a human being. But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church that has problems in this regard. If you listen to the preachers on the radio or on TV or whatever you conjure up on the internet and kind of think it's 
in our day more of a conjuring than anything. But you get various preachers that will claim all sorts of things that are absolutely not true. But if you get steeped in it long enough, you'll begin to believe that it's true. And then when you're presented with what is true, it'll be baffling. And even before the days of the internet, I remember knocking on one man's door and talking about how salvation is centered in baptism and the scriptures say baptism saves you. And the Bible doesn't teach that. I said, yeah. It, it literally teaches that in those words. So baptism now saves you. And this is a man who prided himself in reading the scriptures daily and thoroughly cover to cover and never caught those words in 1 Peter chapter 3. As in the days of the flood, eight people were saved through water. So baptism now saves you. Word for word says it. He was astonished and baffled. Why? Because his teachers had been leading him to and fro in error's maze, astounded. And the idea of the words of that hymn is that once you're in that maze, it's really tough to find your way out and somebody kind of needs to take you by the hand and lead you to the promised land if you'll pardon my reference to a rock and roll song that I referenced last week. Yeah, it, it can be astounding. And so it is that Lutheran pastors, if they're doing their job, urge you to read the Bible cover to cover. Don't look at a publication that is presented to you by your church body and only read that. But on a regular basis, go through the books of the Bible, chapter by chapter. And just to summarize for you again, the easiest way to do that is to start with one of the four Gospels, Read one chapter a day all the way through. When you're done with that, go to the Old Testament. For example, Genesis, chapter by chapter all the way through. Then go to one of the epistles in the New Testament, chapter by chapter all the way through. And every third or fourth book is going to be one of the four Gospels. So you're going to read the Gospels more than anything else, by far. And what this does for you is this gives you a certain amount of Holy Scripture to meditate on for a 24-hour period and call it to mind. You know, you're sitting in traffic, frustrated, and think, okay, what was it I read today? Give you something godly to do. You're waiting in the doctor's office. Ugh, same old magazines. Think about what you read that day or the day before in Holy Scripture and meditate on it, okay? The other thing that this does for you is when you get to those parts of the Bible that are so incredibly tedious and boring, and to be fair, there are those portions. And as you read them faithfully over time, you will see how important they are eventually. But you know, the first hundred times or so we read them, we're kind of going, why is this even here? All right? If it's only a chapter, you can get through one chapter a day and make it through that portion of the scriptures that seems so tedious or boring, or frankly, so condemning when some of the minor prophets go on and on about how God is not happy with human behavior. We can make it through and then get on to one of the beautiful gospels again, where we see how God our Savior became a human being to save us from ourselves and from the wrath of God and his anger over human behavior. Okay? Do it! Follow the example of the men in our Old Testament lesson who are named by name, who really were laymen. The Levites were not the priests. And so they are named. And you go, oh, why, why do we have this tedious reading? And even as I was preparing for today, I was reading through this and I was thinking, do we need to read these names? Why did the church in her wisdom decide that we are going to read the names of these men? Well, it reminds us that the Holy Christian faith is an historical faith. It's real. It's not made up. It's not a bunch of nice little stories to get a little moral lesson from. There are absolutely moral lessons to be gained. But when we read the names of these people and their family lineage, we are reminded that the scriptures are given to human beings, that the story of salvation is all about human beings. And if you take the time 
and you go back to some of those boring portions of scripture and correlate with other portions of scripture, you come to the understanding that Jesus' family line has a whole lot of skeletons in the closet of some really, really disturbing behavior. And in talking to the people, quote unquote, out there, sometimes we get the idea that the Bible um, validates or, or pats on the back such terrible behavior and suggests that it's good. But no, it does not. Not at all. There are things that are prevented, presented in Scripture in the family line of Jesus that are terrible things. Absolutely terrible things. The Bible does not say that they're okay. But if you're reading the entirety of Scripture, you will see where the Scriptures themselves condemn those exact behavior. It does not suggest it's okay. What do we learn from all of this? We learn that Jesus is not afraid to call sinful human beings his brothers and sisters part of his family line. Jesus did not come and become a human being to save nice people. Jesus became a human being to save sinful, fallen, loser-type, terrible, awful people who cringe even at their own sins. So that when we ask the question, am I saved? We don't even need to ask, do I really believe? But we ask this question, did Jesus die for all people? And as we look at the scriptures, we very quickly find, yeah, he died for every human being. God loved the world in this way. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If he died for the sins of the world, and I am part of the world, then he died for me. And when you start to say, yeah, but, then you ask yourselves questions like, am I cringing at my own sin? Am I fearing the wrath of God? Am I afraid of suffering eternally in hell? And when we answer that question, yes, then we know all the more that Jesus died for me. And don't get stuck in this questioning, yeah, but do I really believe? The question is rather, am I willing to call God a liar when he says that Jesus died for me? Yes, but I love my sin, we reply. Yeah, our sinful human nature loves its sin, doesn't it? If we're honest, we actually like it. And we don't like the idea that God says that this or that behavior is wrong because we like this or that behavior. That's the way it is, okay? But we recognize that what God says is good is good and what God says is evil is evil. And based on that, wanting not to suffer, even if only for that, we turn to God and say, forgive me, I get it, I have done wrong. I don't even necessarily feel it so much, but I see in your word, this is your judgment on me. What does any of this have to do with our text? By name, these Levites, these laymen who as a tribe of people, as, as you know, the sons of Levi, were pulled out of all of Israel to be responsible for the upkeep of the temple. When the king got word from God that you know, the temple was in disrepair and the people, the real church of God, the people, was in disrepair as well, make it right, the king called on the Levites to clean up the temple, and they did what as a first thing? They sanctified themselves. If we want to do good in the world in the name of Christ, we first have to be holy. And how do we do that? Well, indeed, we've done that even this morning. And I suppose when we do it over and over, maybe sometimes we don't connect with how profound it is each time we do it. But we gathered together, didn't we? And we sanctified ourselves. We confessed our sin. 
and we received the forgiveness from God himself through his minister, through his agent. And these words are true. We are forgiven. We are holy ones, children of God, part of the royal family. Ours is now the joyful duty to do good in Jesus' name. And as we see these Levites called out by name after they had sanctified themselves, they began to clean the church. And the church is always in need of reformation, just like you and I as individuals are always in need of reform. We are always in need of looking at what is being taught, what is being done, is it in keeping with God's word? It doesn't mean we need to go find boogeymen where they don't exist and insist that even when the church is doing right, somehow it must be wrong because the church is always in need of reform. The point is that we need to always watch out for what's going on in the church. It means, again, we sanctify ourselves. We know the truth. We confess our sins. We receive forgiveness. We look at the church and what it does. And what did these Levites do? They took out the garbage. Everything that did not belong in the church was taken out, was removed from the church. That's step one, get rid of the bad. It's what we do as Christians, as individuals. We get rid of the bad, we confess the sin, and we strive not to do those things that God says are bad. And then, as a second step, we try to do what is pleasing to God, and so it is that those Levites brought in what is good. And you see the priests are mentioned, but they are not called out by name, are they? It's a very interesting thought there. But the priests are the ones that went into the temple proper, the Holy of Holies and the most holy place, and they took care of that. In our day, I suppose that would be this area up here, what we call the chancel or whatever. Uh, in the days of the temple of the Old Testament, before Christ died on the cross for our sins, there was an absolute and definite separation. There was even the curtain between the holy place and the most holy. Even the priests did not go into the most holy place, but the high priest, once a year alone, went into that area. There was separation. But since Jesus died on the cross, St. Paul comments how there is a tear in the curtain of the temple of his body when that sword cut his side that curtain of jesus flesh was torn open and now if you are paying attention you hear various teachers talk about well now the people had access into the most holy place yes they did and some others will say well it's not so much that but but that god came out of the most holy place and is among the people it, it's certainly both and and we can find very definite statements in scripture speaking both ways that we now have access into that most intimate place of god and that's represented for us by our altar rail that it's open in the middle we have access all the way into the most holy things of God. And we are called together to receive with our very mouths that body that was given into death for us and that blood that was shed for our sins to receive into us the sacrifice for our sins, to receive into ourselves that which is holy that we might be united with our head, Jesus, and be his body, the holy Christian church, united in and with him and he in and with us. This is the reality in our day. And so uh, we pay attention to what we are doing as a church. If we are doing things that are leading us astray from the truth, we want to get that out and where those precious ordinances of Jesus, his precious word and his sacraments, 
where they are being downplayed or falling into neglect, we want to put them front and center once again so that our attention, when we look at ourselves and ask, is God okay with me? Our attention is drawn to those things. I have been baptized. God has put his name on me. He has called me his child. And I have received into myself holiness, my Savior's body and blood. Is God okay with me? Yes, he is. My sin has been atoned for. My guilt has been taken away. And I have salvation in his name. So it is that when we celebrate Reformation, it's not so much a rah rah re we threw off the yoke of the, of the Pope. That's not what it's about at all. It's about the fact that the Holy Spirit keeps the gospel and the sacraments alive and present for us so that we can know our status before God and know that he is a truly kind-hearted, patient, and loving God who wants our salvation and makes sure in every generation that his word is available to us and for us and through us and that his sacraments remain untainted so that we may be unified to God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God which goes beyond all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. As we bring our prayers before the Lord, today we remember uh, the families of all those who perished in Seoul, Korea over the weekend uh, when in having joyful time of partying, 151 people lost their lives as the crowd uh, moved together. Let us pray. O eternal and most merciful God, we bless and praise thee for all thy benefits and especially for those mercies which we commemorate this day. Praise be to thee that thou didst send forth thine only begotten Son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins and didst institute the ministry of the word to make known thy saving health among all nations. Praise be to thee especially this day that when the gross darkness of popery covered the earth, thou didst kindle afresh the light of thy holy word and through thy chosen vessel, Martin Luther, didst teach our fathers once more the everlasting gospel of salvation. Praise be to thee that thou hast to this day preserved thy godly heritage, saved us from persecution and confusing creeds, defended churches and schools from the assaults of Satan, given strength and success to thy word, and at all times provided faithful shepherds to feed thy flock in the pleasant pastures of thy word. We acknowledge and confess in sincere repentance that by our manifold sins, ingratitude, indifference, and unbelief, we have indeed deserved that thou mightest justly hide thy face from us and visit us with a famine of thy word. But we beseech thee, O Lord, deal with us not after our sins, but according to thine infinite compassion. Let not the gates of hell prevail against thy church. Preserve us from human traditions and doctrines of men, from strong delusions to subvert the foundation of truth and to mislead men upon false ways. Grant unto us peace and good government, and let truth, justice, and liberty dwell in our land and throughout the world, that without restraint or hindrance, we may continually enjoy the blessing of thy pure word. Preserve unto us and our children the pure and saving gospel and the right use of the holy sacraments till the end of days. Send us to this end at all times, blameless teachers, able ministers of thy New Testament, faithful stewards of thy mysteries, 
and give them wisdom and boldness to proclaim thy salvation to many unto life. Let us not misuse the gospel unto false peace in a dead faith. Being kept by the light of truth, let us walk as the children of light. Let us be a city that is set on a hill to shine afar until the day of Christ's coming. Give us increase of faith and of numbers. Restore all that are deceived by error and give free course and strength to thy word that it may become known among all the nations of the earth. Do good in thy good pleasure to Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Gird us with power that we may fight a good fight and keep the faith until we shall obtain the crown of righteousness laid up in heaven for us, for thy son's sake. And we pray that you would look in mercy upon all those who have lost loved ones or, or who are injured or suffering in any way after the sad catastrophe in Seoul, Korea. We pray that you would draw all to their only Savior, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine that you would drive out the invader and grant your people to stand firm, above all remaining in the true faith unto eternal life. We pray that in your mercy you would restore freedom and peace to their land so that they may worship you in peace and call others to Christ in freedom. We pray also for those who are facing hunger in the days to come, that you would provide for them on a daily basis and grant that the governments of the world might work together in peace and that justice and truth might prevail in all governments, that all people on the earth might have enough for each day. We ask these mercies in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue on page 60. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Oh, 
warm stars. 